So I know that many of you are not coming from the field of systems biology. So you may not be familiar with the nomenclature. So one thing that I decided to do, I decided to have some introduction to some of the most important concepts that uh, you need to really uh, grasp before you starting to apply those network analysis method to the biological system that is the human or mouse cell. However, I did not want to bore you with some uh, list of definitions because in biology a lot of it is nomenclature, learning a language that describes different things. On YouTube there are those amazing animated movies that people have posted to visualize what we believe is happening inside a cell or inside our body. So I took uh, pieces, slices from those YouTube movies and organized them to show you some of the most important concepts of a molecular and cell biology as we understand it today. And this would sort of like just give you a taste of the type of mysterious and exciting and amazing things that we are discovering that are happening at the molecular level inside our cells. You also would appreciate the complexity of the problems that we're trying to address. One thing that we're going to also do after each of those uh, movies or videos that we're going to watch, I'm going to ask you some questions about some of the most important concepts that I would like you to take from those specific movies. So in some cases you may have to watch those movies uh, once or twice to just uh, make sure that you remember some of the most important concepts that then will be helpful when we apply our methods to analyze those networks that are making the human and mouse cell. So this, the first movie doesn't give you too much uh, new information, but it really motivates you to think about the fact that we are made of cells, and those cells are living in our body and functioning to keep us alive. Human body is made of between arguably between 200 and 400 different cell types but there are many copies of those cell types and all of them are organized very precisely to give rise to tissues and organs and then to give rise to our uh, full human body.
Another very important topic in this field is the concept of stem cells and this is a very hot topic in molecular cell biology these days and it really helps you to understand the concepts of a, a system view of the human body how cells make those, those decisions to become what they can become and this also has many new exciting medical applications that are foreseen to be implemented in the relatively near future. At the very earliest stages of development, all cells are equally capable of giving rise to an entire organism. But after only a few rounds of cell division, the cells begin to lose this totipotency and to differentiate sorting into groups that will either contribute to the placenta or to the embryo itself. In this eight-cell embryo, called a morula for its berry-like appearance, all cells express a pair of genes, CDX2 and OCT3-4. But as the cells of the morula go through their next round of division, CDX2 is downregulated in the innermost cells while OCT3-4 remains expressed throughout. The segregation of these genes is maintained as the cells continue to divide, until after about 10 rounds of division, the embryo has become a hollow ball, known as a blastocyst. The outer layer of the blastocyst is made up entirely of cells that express CDX2. This trophectodermal layer will go on to become placenta. On the interior, OCT3-4 marks a small cluster of cells with phenomenal ability to differentiate. This inner cell mass is made up of cells with the developmental potential to give rise to all of the body's many cell lineages, an ability known as pluripotency. And indeed, every one of the cells in your own body can trace its ancestry back to these few dozen pluripotent stem cells. The vast majority of the body's trillions of cells are differentiated, meaning they have taken on specialized properties and functions, and have lost the ability to generate cells of other types. Skin, muscle, blood, bone, and the nervous system are all made up of populations of differentiated cells. There is another type of cell, however, that remains less differentiated and retains its ability to give rise to other cell types. These cells are known as stem cells. Stem cells exhibit two characteristics not found in more differentiated cells. By definition, stem cells are able to divide and make copies of themselves indefinitely, a capacity known as self-renewal. This endless power of division is not limited to creating more stem cells, however. They can also give rise to a wide range of mature cell types. These unique characteristics make stem cells indispensable, both for replenishing the body's cells as they age and are lost, and for constructing the body itself from a tiny number of cells during development. Even after the embryo has grown into an adult, many of the body's cells continually die off and need to be replaced. For example, billions of red blood cells need to be replaced each day. This is the work of stem cells known as hematopoietic stem cells, which are located in the bone marrow. Residing in a complex cellular environment, the hematopoietic stem cell is able to generate precursors to every type of blood cell. And indeed, these stem cells have been used by physicians for decades to replenish patients' blood supplies following radiation treatment for cancer. The stepwise differentiation of a stem cell's progeny depends on combinations of genetic and environmental factors that gradually steer these cells into following a specific lineage. This process involves different sets of stimulating factors operating in the cell's environment at its surface membrane and within its nucleus. Each step down the path draws it closer to becoming a functional red blood cell and entering the bloodstream. 
the lining of the small intestine turns over even faster than the blood. At the microscopic level, this epithelial surface consists of billions of projections called villi, with stem cell containing areas known as crypts near their bases. The intestinal crypt contains slowly dividing stem cells that maintain their own numbers while also producing rapidly dividing progenitors. These transit amplifying cells churn out all of the differentiated cell types needed to migrate upwards and replace older cells as they are shed from the tips of the villi. This constant self-renewal by stem cells is a feature of many of the body's systems, including skin, hair, and bone. Not all of the body's organs regenerate as readily as the blood and the lining of the gut, and the multipotent stem cells that have been identified in the adult body are both limited in their ability to generate other lineages and difficult to maintain in culture. In contrast, the pluripotent cells of the inner cell mass can be harvested and grown indefinitely in vitro and can give rise to every type of cell in the body. These pluripotent cells in culture are known as embryonic stem or ES cells. By culturing these cells under controlled conditions, it is possible to steer their differentiation into specific cell types. For example, ES cells cultured on a bed of stromal feeder cells and treated with inductive factors such as BMP4 and sonic hedgehog tend to differentiate into neural lineages. By testing various ES cell culture conditions, scientists are gaining new insights into the biology of the differentiation processes that build and sustain and may one day be used to heal our bodies. Stem cell researchers are currently exploring ways to differentiate ES cells into lineages that are of great medical and biological interest. The nervous system, the pancreas, and the heart all regenerate too poorly to restore themselves after serious injury or degenerative disease. Scientists are now seeking ways of using the knowledge they gain every day from the study of embryonic and somatic stem cells to help save patients' lives and to improve our understanding of their seemingly limitless potential. So what we saw in the previous movie, we saw that cells can make the decision to differentiate. In general, when we talk about the cell as a complex system, those decisions that are made by cells are the actuator of the system. So those are the decisions that a cell can make and there's not actually many decisions a cell can make. Three other possibilities for decision making for cells are to proliferate or perform cell division, to die or to form self-execution that's called apoptosis, and later on we will talk about the cell signaling that induce the process of apoptosis. And another a third movie that we're going to just watch is how cells can decide to crawl towards a specific direction based on some signals that the cell receive. So the first movie show you under the microscope the process of cell division. New cells are formed by cell division, in which one cell splits to become two cells. Cell division involves two processes. In the first, called nuclear division, the nucleus divides. In the second process, cytokinesis, the cytoplasm divides, producing two cells. In this movie, we'll see cells performing self-execution or apoptosis. This is a famous movie 
that was filmed many years ago and it's been watched at, in YouTube by over a million viewers and it visualized a macrophage chasing a bacteria. Both the macrophage and the bacteria appear to be alive and the fact that the macrophage knows the direction where to crawl to follow the bacteria and eventually swallow it is pretty amazing.